Good morning. Welcome to Alpha Place Baptist Church. Uh, this is our morning service, which uh, for the past few weeks we've been broadcasting on YouTube. Uh, we keep making a point of reiterating how foreign this is to us, how saddened we are not to be able to be meeting physically. We are longing to see each other's faces, to see each other face to face. It's it's such a trial uh, that we're going through. Um, and yet we want to abide by the government's recommendations and we, um, we're being taught a lot during this time. So uh, we go on um, meeting like this uh, as best as we can. We tend to outline what's going on in the week and uh, as has been the case for the past couple of weeks there's only two meetings apart from the Sunday services that I need to advertise um, for the week. There are two prayer meetings. One is on Tuesday evening at 7.30 and one is on Friday at 1 p.m. Both of those take place through the software Google Meet. Uh, so that's Tuesday 7.30 p.m. and Friday 1 p.m. Uh, details of how to access both of those meetings uh, can be sent to you if they're not being sent to you already. Don't forget about our evening service. Uh, that's at 5 p.m. today. I'll be leading and speaking at that service as well. Uh, that's a different service to this morning service. Uh, we'll be looking at different Bible passages, different prayers, different readings, uh, different sermon. Uh, so definitely worth your time, uh, please do make a point of meeting with us uh, this evening as well as this morning, since we want to spend the whole day worshipping God together. The same uh, will take place, God willing, next week as well. Uh, services on YouTube, uh, 11 o'clock in the morning and 5 p.m. on next Lord's Day, if the Lord wills. Let me read to us from God's word. We read that Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. He said, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles brothers what shall we do Peter replied repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted their message were baptised, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Do you believe that Jesus, who was crucified, is Lord and King? Have you repented? Have you been baptised? Have you had your sins forgiven? Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Do you realise that this offer is for you and for your children, for everyone? Even if you feel you are, you are far off from church, this offer is for you. Will you be added to our number? And if you've already been added to our number, do you appreciate the gifts that God has lavished on you through his son? Let's consider these things as we sing our first hymn together. It's I hear thy welcome voice.
us pray. Our Father in heaven, we turn to you on this Sunday morning so greatly in need of your help. We think of your dear Son making himself known to his disciples when he broke the bread. That moment where they knew it was Jesus. And we pray that in the same way as they experienced, you'd open our eyes too. The eyes of our faith. That we may behold the Lord Jesus in all his redeeming work this morning. Thank you that he was the lamb without defect or blemish who was pointed to in the Old Testament. Thank you that he destined before the foundation of the world that he would come and make a way for his people to be saved. And thank you for the fulfilment of that promise, the, the, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. For our sake, we pray that we would trust in him. We praise you for raising him from the dead, for giving him glory. We know you did that, Father, so that our faith and our hope could confidently be set on you. So please help us to purify our souls by obeying the truth so that we may have genuine, mutual love. May we know what it means to, to love each other as members of your church. And not just a superficial love, but to love each other deeply from the heart. Lord, we know that if we're believers, then, then we've been born again. We've been given new life. We've been regenerated. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed. We've been given life that will last forever through your living and enduring word. And so this can give us confidence to know that we can go on in good deeds because you've given us everything that we need. We know that your word tells us that you long to be gracious to us. You are not a stingy God. You love to, to rise up and to show compassion to your church. For you, Lord, you are a God of justice. You are the kindest, fairest judge. And, and since we are in Christ, you can do nothing but show love to us. We know that it's even true that you, you love us as much as you love your own son. May we know that we will be blessed if we wait for you. May we know that there will come a day when we will weep no more. May we believe that you'll be gracious to us when we cry for help. That as soon as you hear, you answer us. That you give us what we pray for. Or you give us what we would pray for if we knew what you know. You're such a kind God. Many of us know what it means to, to be eating the bread of adversity right now, Lord. To be drinking the water of affliction, as your word calls it. You, Lord Jesus, our teacher. May it not feel ever like you're hiding yourself from us. And may we be confident that we will see you, Lord Jesus. That there will be a day when, whether we turn to the left or turn to the right, our ears will hear your voice. Wherever we are on the new earth, we will be able to hear your voice, Lord Jesus, saying, This is the way. Walk in it. And we will gladly obey 
Oh, we long for that day, Lord Jesus. May it come quickly. May you come quickly. May this, th these be the things that, that drive us on in our Christian lives. And we pray this in your name, Christ, the one who lives and reigns with you, Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our one God, both now and forever. Amen. What I want to do now uh, is something a little bit different. Um, last year, uh, a friend of mine was planning for Easter and uh, we talked about whether I could write a story for children uh, for Easter time. Uh, the story didn't get used for the purpose that we'd planned for it, but I've still got the story and I thought it would be good for me to read it to you now. Um, it's especially got children in mind but it, it I hope it will be helpful for all of us so I'm going to read the story it's called Grumpy Thomas here it is today had been a grumpy day for Eddie the boy who hated to play and read and write and count in school why on earth was numeracy treated ever so humorously when it actually was really really hard and why all the singing, the laughing, the grinning? Mr Evans, the head, must be mad. And now it's time for the worst of all. Instead of playing with his ball at home, Eddie is being dragged to assembly. So Eddie starts crying and desperately trying to run right out of that school hall but Mr Evans says, stop. And though Ed wants to pop, he's scared of the head teacher's shouting. And so they sit down. And to avoid a meltdown, Mr Evans tells Eddie a story. Let me tell you of someone who was exactly like you, son. He was grumpy and furious and silly. This guy's name was Thomas, but since he was pompous, his friends all called him Grumpy Thomas. But things really changed when it was arranged that Tom should meet someone called Jesus. Jesus was different, made Tom feel significant. Yet Jesus told him that he needed to change. One day, Jesus decided that Tom should be guided to a dangerous city called Judea. Tom said, no way. Have you forgotten the other day when in Judea we nearly got killed? But Jesus said, death is really no stress. So they went and a guy called Lazarus, who died got raised from the dead. On another occasion came some more frustration when Jesus said, Thomas, I'm leaving. But Tom wanted to know the way he should go to get to where Jesus was going. But Jesus said, oh, you know where to go. And Thomas screamed, no, I don't. And then on a Friday came the very worst day. Jesus, he suddenly died. These soldiers, they grabbed him and hammered his hands in with nails. And they pierced his side. And even though Jesus had warned Grumpy Thomas that this death was what needed to happen... Thomas was shocked, and his bedroom he locked, sulking, grumpily, refusing to move. But when Thomas came out of his room, all his doubt was met with a crazy suggestion. Jesus is alive. Your heart he'll revive. He'll take all your sulking away. But of course, Tom's reply, like sour apple pie 
was still grumpy and stubborn and stupid. I won't ever believe you. Unless you can point to that great gaping hole they made in his side. Thomas, that's gross. Don't be so morose. So they left him to stew in his anger. But in exactly a week, Tom gave a shriek when he actually saw Jesus alive. Come, look at the wound. Stick your fingers in, dude. I won't judge you for being so weird. But Thomas, he fell to his knees and said, Well, of course, you're my Lord and my God. So, what about you, Eddie? Do you think that you're ready to admit that it's just so wrong to be in a grump when you hit a bump and feel so incredibly angry? Jesus is sad when you act like that. And do you even care that he's alive? The great things that cross. Jesus died for the lost, for the grumpy, the angry, the silly. And then Jesus rose. So do you suppose that you'll see what Thomas saw, Eddie? Jesus was his Lord. Jesus was his God. But what do you say? How about you? The other thing I wanted us to do was to read through Psalm 116. Uh, so we're going to read uh, verses 1 to 3 and verses 10 to 19. The words will come up on your screen and as has been the case over the past few weeks, you'll read the words in red and I'll read the words in black as a call and response opportunity for worship through this psalm. So it's Psalm 116, uh, words coming up on your screen now. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. What shall I return to the Lord? I will lift up the cup of salvation. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord Truly I am your servant, Lord I will sacrifice a thank offering to you I will pay my vows to the Lord. In the courts of the house of the Lord. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to read from verse 13 to 35. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. This is God's holy word. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. 
as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Clopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told us uh, then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Amen. It's only been a fortnight since Easter, so I thought it would be good for us to continue looking at the resurrection accounts. And we're just going to concentrate on verses 13 to 27 of Luke 24 today. And we'll look at the bit uh, where they actually recognise Jesus next week. If you've seen the animated film, uh, which is based on Exodus uh, and the life of Moses, uh, the Prince of Egypt, you will remember the song, The Plagues. During that song, uh, Moses and uh, the Pharaoh sing about how they saw each other as brothers in their childhood and um, how none of them wanted these plagues to happen um, and near the end of the song there's a frame which I know filmmakers describe as the mirrored confrontation shot the mirrored confrontation shot uh, you'll have seen this kind of image in, in lots of films or on posters on book covers uh, the, the screen or, or the, the picture is divided in half and it pits the two main characters or the two main parties against each other on either side of the screen. 
you can imagine if someone was making the the road to Emmaus, the movie, uh, they might choose a mirror confrontation shot for part of this scene. Jesus on one side and Clopas and his companion on the other. Why do I think that would be an appropriate shot? Well, because this scene, despite it being one in which Jesus does come alongside these two, um, shows kindness, love, understanding. It's also a scene of, of confrontation. And that's what I want to look at for the first point. Take a walk down the road to Emmaus and prepare for confrontation. Take a walk down the road to Emmaus and prepare for confrontation. Let's set the scene then. Verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. We know from verse 18 that one of them, one of these two people, was called Clopas. Now we don't know who the other person was. So there's two people on that first Easter Sunday and um, we don't know why they were walking there. Um, all we know is that there were two people. One of them was a guy called Clopas, and that they were walking to Emmaus. So that's what they were doing, but what, what were they saying? Well, verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. What was this everything that had happened? Well, well, it's what Luke has been writing about. The Lord Jesus being arrested, crucified, dying, being buried and rising again. They could talk of nothing else, but their interpretation of these events was what Jesus wanted to challenge. As they were walking along and chatting about all these things that had just happened, verse 15, we read, Jesus himself came up and walked alongside them or along with them. You recall is that you you'll recall that Jesus is the one they're talking about and that Jesus is the one who'd been crucified and crucified and that Jesus was the one who who'd risen again. It, it is this Jesus who walks right up to them and, and joins in with their conversation. But then comes verse 16, which is interesting. They were kept from recognising him. Before they they get to have the, the confirmation that Jesus really is alive, they've got much, much learning to do. If Jesus had been revealed uh, to them immediately, all the lessons on the road to Emmaus would not have been learned. And so God decides to, to obscure Jesus' face somehow. So that to them, this is just another bloke walking along the road to Emmaus. Jesus' aim here is to get them to see that all these things that had happened over the past few days were planned from the beginning. And that if they had the sense, they could have read about them in their Bibles or in the Bibles at their synagogue. And so in order to teach them these things he does what he does best he asks questions as we've seen before this is what jesus does throughout the bible he asks questions look at verse 17 jesus asked them what are you discussing together as you walk along their reply is one of upset as if to say oh you, you don't know about these awful traumatic tragic events these crazy things that have been happening. Oh, how awful that we have to be the bearers of bad news to you. End of verse 17. This is what we have. They stood still, their faces downcast. And verse 18, one of them named Clopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? It would be like someone meeting you and your friend at the bus stop on September the 11th, 2001, and asking you, oh, what are you talking about? It'd be quite an upsetting question to have to answer. 
on days of major disaster or trauma, there is a, a collective familiarity with what has happened. Everyone knows. It's assumed that everyone knows that the direct facts don't need to be trawled through again and again. Speculation and, and expressions of, of shock surrounding the events are what people are more prepared to talk about. So that when Jesus asks them what they're talking about, there's a real pain in having to bring up and, and talk through what has happened. But Jesus has reason for asking. He wants to know how they articulate these events, how they frame it. And so in reply to their question in verse 19, he says, what things? But we know what he was getting at. What really he wanted to know was how they interpreted these events. Tell me how you see these things, Jesus really was saying. And so they do. Look at the end of verse 19, down to verse 24. Well, they say, uh, these things are about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our own companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they didn't see Jesus. On first reading, you might think this is a worthy description of the uh, life and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but it's riddled with problems. Think, for example, of the fact that they said he, he was a prophet. He wasn't just a prophet. He was the prophet. <laughs> the word of God himself. They say that... They'd hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But he's not just the one who was going to redeem Israel. He came to redeem the whole world. And their hope in him is clearly not one that they have anymore. Once more, there is a sense of shock in their revealing, uh, it, or rather in their recalling of Jesus' crucifixion. As if something had gone seriously wrong. That's a shame because, as we'll come to see, God had planned that these things would happen. Nothing was out of control. But their reading of the resurrection accounts is the most disappointing. They didn't find his body, they say, as if this was a search for a corpse, not a living man. There was real scepticism in their reporting that the women said they'd seen a vision of angels who told them he was alive these two people really don't seem to believe that Jesus is alive at all. It's a totally foreign idea to them, which they feel is confirmed by the fact that their companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Now, please understand, I'm not saying I would have behaved any better had I been in their position. But their errors do need to be acknowledged. We know that the way they were thinking was wrong because of the Lord's response in verse 25. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. This is when the confrontation comes. It's a strong reply. That there's something markedly unwise in the way that they are interpreting these events. Jesus' reply is very clear. Look at verse 26. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? In other words, you shouldn't be shocked at Jesus dying on the cross. It had to happen. Come on, guys. We're taking a walk down the Emmaus Road. And I hope that our preparation for confrontation was worth it. 
I read of a con man in California who attempted to pass a forged check uh, written on a checkbook that he'd stolen from a post box. The problem is that the cashier in the bank in which the con man was trying to cash or, or pay in the check was the actual person whose checkbook he had stolen. And so, of course, the plan didn't work. Some confrontations are unavoidable. And this is one such confrontation. They met none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself on the road. That was a confrontation and a half. But now we need to actually look into the details of what Jesus was confronting them about. So this is point two, uh, point two of four. Listen to what Jesus says about why they should have been expecting the Messiah's death and resurrection. Verse 27 is one of my favourites in all the Bible. It's when Jesus says, I'm beginning, um, oh, we described, it's described what Jesus said. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Beginning with Moses doesn't mean that he began with the story of Moses. It means he began at the very beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis, which Moses wrote along with the other four uh, books of the Bible, first books of the Bible. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, uh, tra traditionally called the Pentateuch. What we're reading in that verse then is, is that Jesus explained the whole of the Old Testament to them and showed them that it was all talking about him. Read it again and see if you can see that, that that really is what Jesus is saying. Verse 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now often people say, oh, I wish, wish this had been recorded for us, what, what Jesus actually said. Which I understand. I understand why people say that. But I think that if Luke had thought it worth including the details of what Jesus had said, he would have. He had two people he could have spoken to about what Jesus had said. The reason Luke doesn't include what Jesus said about the Old Testament uh, and its speaking of himself was because it, it was already covered in the previous portions of his gospel. Here are just a few examples from Luke's gospel. There's Luke's quoting of Isaiah in relation to John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way for this suffering saviour, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. All people will see God's salvation. That's Isaiah 40. And Luke quotes it in chapter 3 of his gospel. It's probably something Jesus included in his study on the Emmaus Road. We have another record in, in Luke of Jesus preaching from the Old Testament. Uh, from Isaiah again, chapter 61 this time. Do you remember that bit in the synagogue where he's preaching and he says, uh, he reads from Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's what he says. I'm sure Jesus spoke of that on the Emmaus Road. Then there's all the times in Luke's Gospel where he makes a, a point of quoting people as Jesus being the son of David uh, to show that he is the promised king, uh, spoken of especially in 2 Samuel 17, in that covenant between the Lord and David. Jesus, no doubt, mentioned that on the Emmaus Road too. There's Jesus quoting in Luke the prophet Jeremiah, in relation to the people's abuse of the temple. Jesus no doubt mentioned that to them on the Emmaus Road too. Uh, how about that bit in Luke when Jesus quotes Psalm 118 to the people? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And his exegesis of it when he says, Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken in pieces. Anyone who, on whom it falls will be crushed. That was included too, I'm sure. Or the quote from Isaiah 53 when Jesus says to his disciples, It is written, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. 
Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfilment. These two are the sorts of things that Jesus would have mentioned to those two whilst walking along the road to Emmaus. What's more, Luke knew that this content would also be covered in the subsequent portions of the, of the Luke sequel, uh, which is Acts. And if you look through Acts, you can you can see um, Acts two and Acts seven and other uh, chapters that I've covered here, but we haven't got time to go into. We've been listening to what Jesus says about why they should have been expecting the Messiah's death and resurrection. Perhaps you've heard of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, one of the deadliest volcanic eruptions in human history. Why was it so deadly? Well, because no one was expecting it. I'm reliably informed that without warning, or at least without any warning that they recognised, Mount Vesuvius spewed a deadly cloud of superheated tephra and gases to a height of 21 miles, ejecting molten rock, pulverised pumice and hot ash at 1.5 million tonnes per second, ultimately releasing 100,000 times the thermal energy of the Hiroshima-Nagasaki bombings. That was the first experience that Roman civilization had ever had of a volcanic eruption. It was such a surprise to them that they didn't even have a word in their language to describe what was going on. If they had understood the way that volcanoes worked, they would have known that previous to the volcanic eruptions that there are usually earthquakes. But these earthquakes are recorded in the records of uh, the people who lived around Mount Vesuvius, but they ignored those earthquakes. They ignored the warnings. Jesus is spoken of, and it appears in a similar way to the people who lived uh, around Mount Vesuvius. The warnings were not recognised. The prophecies and the appearances of Christ in the Old Testament were not recognised by his followers. Now, so far we've been allowed to be somewhat passive in this, but I do want to turn this on us and to see if we fall short where they fell short. And so here's point three. Where does the Lord Jesus accusation hit you? Where does the Lord Jesus accusation hit you? Let's turn Jesus accusation that he made against Clopas and his companion to ourselves, to myself. Verse 25. Could this be said of you? How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What is your attitude towards the Old Testament? Are you looking for prophecy and teaching on the Messiah and his suffering and glorification throughout the Bible? Is that something that you do? In essence, do you see that all the scriptures are about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, perhaps you didn't know anything about this at all. Perhaps you're just watching this on YouTube because you stumbled across it and you really have no idea what's going on <laughs> but but you you're strangely drawn to it and and you're watching well i'm so happy that you're doing that welcome and let me tell you perhaps for the first time the whole bible is about jesus but perhaps you just have a a rudimentary grasp of grasp of christianity maybe you've been in and out of churches your whole life maybe you're a church member but you thought that Jesus only arrived on the scene in Bethlehem that anything written before that was totally irrelevant to Jesus well to that Jesus says no he is spoken of and appears long before Bethlehem if you did not know that Jesus uh, if you didn't know that that verse is directed at you too. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
But perhaps you're a bit more nuanced, nuanced than that. And you say, well, I know Jesus is spoken of in the Old Testament, but not that much. It's in the odd place here and there. Well, to that, Jesus again says to you, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Do you not realise that Jesus had said these things about all the scriptures, not the odd place? But then again, perhaps you are even more nuanced still and you say, well, yes, I agree that all the scriptures are about Jesus. Yeah, I get that. But the best place to go is the New Testament. Now that we have the New Testament, perhaps you say, the Old Testament is a bit pointless. It's just not as good as the New Testament. To which again, I think Jesus says to you, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken, i.e. all the Old Testament has spoken. The Old Testament speaks of the Lord Jesus, and according to Jesus, it is just as worthy a source as the New Testament to find out about the humiliation and exaltation of Christ. Here's what Martin Luther said about the subject. All the promises of God lead back to the first promise concerning Christ of Genesis 3.15. The faith of the fathers in the Old Testament era and our faith in the New Testament era are one and the same faith in Christ Jesus. The faith of the fathers was directed at Christ. Time does not change the object of true faith or the Holy Spirit. There has always been and always will be one mind, one impression, one faith concerning Christ among true believers, whether they live in times past, now or in times to come. Is that new information to you? Perhaps it is. May I ask you, have you met the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you know that one of the best places to meet him is in the Old Testament scriptures? If you were in that first category, someone who really hasn't got much of an idea at all, then I invite you to come to, to get to know Jesus better. Keep watching these sermons as they go up twice every week. And watch other stuff. There's a pastor called Steve Levy, who is the pastor of a church called Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Swansea. He's been putting up 10-minute videos every day on YouTube. Um, Look those up if you want to know more. If you want to hear more about the Lord Jesus Christ in all the scriptures, he is the one through whom God has spoken in these last days. If you're in that second category that I described, someone who thinks the Old Testament is a bit rubbish now that we have the New Testament, that it doesn't really say much about Jesus at all, I hope you stand corrected. See, see that the whole thing is about Christ. Every verse is about him. But perhaps, uh, and maybe this is the most likely option, you're in that third category. You know the Old Testament is about Jesus, but you just don't see it that clearly. Well, the reason for that is because you are working from the wrong framework. Whether you know it or not, everyone has a framework, or, or if you want to use a different metaphor, glasses through which they view the Bible. We all have these glasses on or, or a particular framework, whether we know it or not. And the reason you don't see Jesus in the Old Testament is because you're working from the wrong framework. Think of someone who's never seen Star Wars. Uh, maybe that's you. You've now watched Star Wars, and to you I say, that's fine. <laughs> but let me give this person, maybe it's you, who's never seen Star Wars, uh, as an example. And I imagine them watching the sequels, the recent sequels to the films from the 1970s. There's these famous characters from those old films. There's Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia and Han Solo. They appear in the new films. 
and in the new films, when those old characters appeared, there, there were cheers in the cinemas. But for someone who'd never seen the previous films, or someone who didn't care about the previous films, the appearance of those older characters, once again, was absolutely irrelevant. So if you, if you, if you don't know that Jesus is spoken of in the Old Testament, and in fact appears in the Old Testament, and you are instead approaching the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, as an obscure, irrelevant document from ancient days, then the appearances and prophecies of Christ in the Old Testament, the fact that the whole of the Old Testament is about Christ, will be irrelevant to you, and you will have missed the whole point. So to close, let me give you some tools to start off with. Things to look for in the Old Testament as you read it and listen to it, excuse me, uh, to encourage you to obey Christ's command, uh, to see him in all the scriptures. This is the fourth and final point. Point four, don't go on without the right framework. Don't go on without the right framework. Look at verse 26 again of Luke 24. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? There are three things here then that Jesus indicates you should be seeing in the Old Testament. These are not the only three things uh, that make up the framework, but they are three important things uh, that Jesus deems important to mention. Uh, they are as follows. The three things from verse 26. The Messiah, his suffering, and his being glorified. The, the Messiah, his suffering, and his being glorified. So with the Messiah, uh, what you're looking for is any mention of a coming king, any anointings, Messiah, after all, means anointed one. Any repeated patterns of people acting as saviours. Uh, kings. They either lie about the coming king by being bad kings or, or point forward to the coming king by being good kings. All of them and all of these themes, they point to Jesus, the Messiah. What's more, there are appearances of Jesus himself in the Old Testament where he is displayed as the king. Often these appearances are, uh, show him um, in, in heaven uh, as, uh, as, as a majestic, regal king. Or often it is him as the angel of the Lord, showing that he is the God who deserves to be worshipped. We're being pointed to the Messiah. How about the fact that this Messiah would suffer? Well, that's all of the animal sacrifices and offerings and all of the examples of Bible heroes who suffer for their faith. And then specific prophecies that speak of servants who suffer or kings who are plotted against or even God himself causing the ones he loves to suffer. And then where do we see the idea of this Messiah being glorified in the Old Testament. Well, this is any teaching in the Old Testament about resurrection and ascension and any exaltation of the Messiah. It's there whenever we see resurrection hope. We see it with people like Abraham, who, who knew that even if his promised son was killed, he would rise again. Uh, and with all the content in Genesis about where people should be buried and finding a tomb for people and bringing people's bones to different places, they all have resurrection hope. It's there too with people like Jonah being saved from drowning and spat out onto dry land. It's even there in the Psalms with the references to, to a table being pre prepared before one's enemies or the Holy One, not seeing decay. So this week, as you're reading your Old Testament, look out for these themes. Or as you're listening to the Old Testament. Or as whoever leads your family worship, if you have family worship in your house. As you're hearing the Old Testament, look out for these themes. This is about the Messiah, you should be saying to yourself. This is about the fact that 
he suffers. This is about the fact that he will be glorified. After his suffering, you'll be amazed at what you see. All that's left for me to tell you is that since Jesus is the one who is the Messiah, the Saviour, and since he did suffer, and since he did rise again, then that means that he can be trusted, and that he should be worshipped. We've all been confronted by Christ today, and we all fall short. But the same Christ, that same Lord Jesus, he died on the cross instead of his people, which is what all those Old Testament sacrifices were pointing to. And he rose again so that we can be given life. He says that whoever comes to him, he will not ever turn away. That's a promise to so come to him and see that the whole of the Bible is all about him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that you would help us to accept this rebuke from Christ and that we'd see him. We want to see him. Please forgive us if we fail to see him in the Old Testament. Please forgive us if we fail to see him in creation. Please forgive us if we fail to worship him as he deserves to be worshipped. Thank you that he is alive and we pray that we make all of our lives all about him, just like the Bible is all about him. And we pray this in his name. Amen. We're going to sing about him now. And perhaps this song describes uh, your experience. Perhaps it's an experience you've had before. Or it's an experience you're having even now. I saw a new vision of Jesus.
may you invoke as Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds and live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. May you know what it means to be ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors. May it be that you have been ransomed, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Amen.